Hello and welcome to the UK Wildlife Podcast with me, Victoria Hillman. And me, Neil Phillips. And this is a special episode that we decided that we would actually do. And it's all about little photography projects that you can do in your home, well, home and garden, and also while you're out on your walks. So we're going to skip the news and the normal things we do. Just a very quick shout out to Nick Baker of Really Wild Show and Weird Creatures fame. Um, and, you know, child, we we're big fans of him as kids, weren't we, Vic? Uh, Definitely, with, yeah. Very much he, so. he did. Still fans now as well, I should mention, not just as kids, because uh, he was a champion of the uh, overlooked creatures that we're big fans of. So just a quick shout out because he has a live stream on Instagram. I don't know if it's every day, around 11-ish. I asked him a question about pond creature photography because he'd asked me a question and I was just seeing how he got on with it. And he very kindly gave a plug to uh, not only my pond man stuff, but also, also this podcast and said nice things about me and the podcast. I sh- I'm not sure if he actually is a listener. I should have asked him, shouldn't I? But if you are, Nick, hello and thank yeah, you very much. <laughs> yeah, so that's a quick shout out there. But I think we'll go straight on to... So basically, these are all little projects you can do while we're stuck in this lockdown. And I think Vic is going to start for us. I am. And I'm going to do... I'm actually going to start with a general macro photography in the garden. So this is being, you know, out in your garden or even when you're out on your daily exercise, if you're going out for a walk, um, you know, wherever. And it, it's general macro photography of plants and um, invertebrates. So if you've got a garden, then, you know, great. You can go out and find lots of little creatures and plants. Um, if not, you know, like I said, on, on that walk, just just walk slowly and see what you can find. I mean, I know we went for a walk on Tuesday and saw six different species of butterfly. So there's definitely a lot out there to find. So in terms of kind of general macro photography, just a few kind of ideas and tips for you. Um, so what you can do is you can go out and actually I'd recommend this if you're a morning person, go out first thing in the morning, because if you're particularly looking for invertebrates, they're going to be cold and you know, they, they, which means they're not going to be moving as much and they're going to be a lot more easy to photograph. But if you've got any plants coming up as well, you get them in that lovely morning light. And there's lots of different things you can do. So you can either just do a nice kind of plain flower against a background or invertebrate against a background, or you can incorporate some of the habitat. One of the beauties about doing it in the garden is that you've got the time there you you don't have anyone kind of pushing you on you're not really going hopefully not going to get that that disturbed (laughs) while you're doing it um depends if you have children children (laughs) or or dogs um you've got more time to really kind of get stuck into it and chances are if you've got invertebrates coming into your garden if they're there one day they're probably going to be there quite frequently as well so you've got a nice little natural studio right there and at the moment, we've got really good weather for it. Light's been absolutely wonderful, apart from in the middle of the day. I actually tried doing some filming the other day, and it was way too bright and way too contrasty. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you can go out there, experiment, um, probably use a tripod unless you're going to be lying on the ground because it'll actually save, you know, neck ache or shoulder ache. And yeah experiment with maybe using a little light or if you've got a little reflector you can try using a little reflector um so just kind of some some general tips there really i mean there's lots to be had i mean at the moment the bees are uh, pretty much everywhere i know my two bug hotels are absolutely mm-hmm. covered in bees um they're very busy so there's not much chance to photograph them in my bee hotel which is full of red mason bees uh, if you get them first thing in the morning when they're trying to warm up and sometimes, just as the sun's going down, and even at night if you've got a little light, they'll be sitting in their little bamboo holes and just have their head right sort of just inside. And you can get a picture of them inside their hole quite easily. So uh, that's something I've done a couple of times. That's worth a try. Oh, uh, yeah. I actually went to check mine the other night and there was a couple of little faces, but they were quite far down in the holes. Um, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. But, yeah, I mean, go out, have a look at night. And actually going out and doing some photography at night as well if you have a pond in your garden and we Mm. will come on to pond photography a little bit later um you know you might find newts or frogs and at night time you'll also get the roosting insects as well yeah so you know just have a look around and you know experiment with you know maybe shoot landscape or portrait incorporate a little bit of habitat and just have a play and see what you come up with now i'm going to move 
onto the dreaded feather things. The hey. dreaded feather thing. Feathered. The dreaded feathered things. There we go. I got it eventually. Um, so birds, 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 birds. If you've got bird feeders in your garden, you have subjects coming in and visiting, hopefully. And first thing you probably need to do is set up some sort of hide. So that can be your shed. Just a window you can leave open. It's warm enough now you can get away with it. Or sometimes you get away with just sitting still, sort of, especially if you sort of sit half behind or half in a bush. Neighbours might give you a funny look, but never mind. I've got one of these pop-up hides, which you can use. I have got a bag hide, but I have to admit, I can't, of the sort of 10 times I've used it, I don't think maybe once or twice it's worked well. The problem with a bag hide is if you move at all, the whole bag moves and it can scare off the creatures, whereas if you have a hide, is you can sit and have a nice chair, camera on a tripod and just wait for the birds to come in um, or if you know if you're in your kitchen you can sit there you can have a cup of tea and everything going on really can't you have a camera set up at your window sounds far uh, better to me <laughs> yeah that does sound quite good now if you've got feeders you'll almost certainly this by pure luck you've put them in or you've thought of this when you put them there uh, you'll probably have to move your feeders if you move them sort of slightly each day to a good spot so you want somewhere where you can get a clean background Think about what angle the sun's going to be at when you're going to be shooting. So early morning is usually nicest light. And I've set up, so I've got my hide to the east of the where the feeders are. So the sun comes up behind me. Yeah, and I've put the feeders a bit lower than I had before. So they're sort of eye level. Uh, I had, didn't really think very much about the background when I did it, though. So I'm going to have to slightly modify it. I took some nice, nicest pictures, I thought. But Ben Andrew, again, <laughs> we mentioned in the last podcast, pointed out I probably needed a better perch. So... Look out, have a look around your garden for some sort of nice looking twig or branch to put above the food. And you have got to try and place it. It's going to be a bit of trial and error. And the birds will ignore it sometimes, much to your annoyance, um, as they did to me last, yesterday morning it would have been actually. Um, and I didn't get any shot. And I got one shot, even though on Twitter I came and I got none. Uh, yeah, you're trying to put this perch you want them to sit on between the food and where they tend to gather. So you'll probably find... If you watch your birds at the feeders one day, they tend to gather in a certain bush or from a certain direction. If you've got a hedgerow or, you know, some sort of cover and they'll fly to the feeder from there. If you put the perch between and slightly above the where the food is, they quite often land on it. And if you get a big flock come in, you'll find some birds are sitting on the feeders and the others will start sitting on this perch in theory. And you'll be able to get some shots while they basically queue up to get the food, which can be quite handy. And yeah, that's sort of your basic garden bird photography. I've used it many a time, really. I've even used it in a car park at Lock Garden to get crested tits, that technique. Although you didn't need a hide there, they actually just come in. But uh, yeah, so there's your basics for you. And you might want to have it if you're in a hide. Make sure you, you can get down low because you might get blackbirds coming in at the ground level as well. So that's something else to look out for. You might want to put a nice log on the ground with some food on to try and get them to sit on that as well. That's another way of getting a nice shot of a bird there. But um, yeah. Very underrated our garden birds, so have a go at them while you can, basically, and got time. And I think the other thing, like you said about feeding them in the perches and that, mm. uh, the other thing, I've not actually been photographing the birds in my garden, but I do sit and watch them a lot. And we've got, at the moment, it's a makeshift bird bath. The mm. proper oh, bird yeah. bath is on order. It's supposed to be coming in a couple of weeks' time. But that's the other thing. If you put out a tray, so our makeshift bird bath, it's a plant pot with a plant tray sat in the top of it. And I have put a few little pebbles to one side in case any insects get in so they can get back out again. And I just top it up with water every day. And we've had, I mean, just while we sitting at the table today, we had starlings, blackbirds, house sparrows, great tit and robin all come down and wait their turns to actually wash in the bath as well. And you know, it's a great opportunity to actually get some behavior and some action shots there. Mm. And like Neil was saying, you know, if you've got a lot of birds coming down in one go for feeding, we've actually noticed that there seems to be this almost like queue. Seems very yeah. British of our birds. Um, yeah. <laughs> they basically have this queue and this this order in which they go and bathe. And the starlings normally get priority. Um, and then really it's the great tit. The great tit chases everything else off. Um, mm. But that's the other option. You know, a simple bird bath, it, all it has to be is a tray with some water in it and we have a second one on the ground and they'll use that just as much and they'll drink from it as well so you're actually helping them because it helps them keep clean but it you know some action shot options there for you as well yeah i mean if you're really super keen you can get a you might have sitting around hopefully uh, one of these they're called potting trays i think they are you know you can or the grow bag trays and you can put them on the ground or slightly raised off put some moss and or branches or stones at one end hopefully the birds will come down you can put a bit of food 
in there as well. The birds come down and you get reflection shots that way as well. So that's something else to play around with too. Yeah, I've reflection. seen a few people actually do those yeah. as well. Yeah. I mean, so a friend of mine's literally built a, uh, I think if you go on, is it Nature TTL website? It's got a guide to doing this. Mm. You can actually build a, like a, almost like a bed frame type thing. And uh, I think you can use a lot, you know, and use a, a pond liner or some agricultural plastic type stuff and make a proper fantastic one. And some of these photographic hides you pay to go in have things like that as well yeah lot, lots of things to do and if we end up staying <laughs> there for a while but it could the beauty is as long as you've got a tolerant of a half or you live on your own or whatever you can set it up now and it'll always be there so if you have a day where you're not feeling too great at the weekend you then you know you can have a go at doing that instead of going out or whatever if, you know you can set your set, set things up now to use in the future too so yeah, I mean that that's is, is a good, really good point because actually that's what we've been doing. We've made the op, we've made the decision to redo our garden this year, and so there's a lot of planting going on, a lot of season. And okay, it might not look so great this year, but in future years, it's designed to actually entice in the invertebrates more than anything. Yeah. But you know, I've finished my pond now; that looks much better. And yeah, you know, it's actually you know, in a couple of years' time, it's going to look absolutely amazing. So any of these little projects that you do now, you can actually just keep them installed in your garden. And yeah. just keep working on them. Yeah, and it makes a great little long term project actually that you can just dip in and out of. Yeah, and quickly before I mean, sort of going back to the last topic, if you just leave a bit of your lawn unmowed, just or sort of going back over the other podcast you did before anyway, isn't it? Mm. You'll have more subjects a bit later in the year in case we get locked down again. So maybe, you know, plan ahead there. But uh, going back to reflection shots, so see, I should have stayed on reflection shots because that would have been a nice segue into the next one. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, no, so, I, mean, I think I've wandered off before you did, which is general pond photography. We've split kind of water, let's call it water based photography or like pond yeah. photography. So I'm going to kind of quickly chat through some general pond photography. And because it's me, it's mainly focused around frogs and toads. Sure. Um, but also other, other uh, invertebrates that will come and use. Um, a small body of water that you have or a pond so one of the best things you can do actually in your garden is put a little pond in and it doesn't have to be very big at all and these can provide hours days weeks months years of photographic opportunities for you so we'll start off with actually invertebrates so a small body of water in your garden can actually entice in damselflies obviously if, if you have a bigger area you might get dragonflies but we only have our pond is about, I think it's like about a meter square. So it's not very big at all. And we actually have damselflies overposting in our pond. And then you actually, if you keep an eye out, come kind of later on in spring and then into summer, if you've seen the damselflies overposting, keep an eye out for the larvae coming out and then actually, you know, coming out and kind of coming up a, a stem, a grass stem or something. If you've got, make sure you've got something in there, they can come up, they can crawl up. And and then you can actually f either film or photograph that whole process um, as they burst out into lovely, beautiful yeah. little damselflies. Do a time lapse if it's still enough, can't you? Yeah, I mean, if it's not windy, you could certainly do a time lapse and if it's not moving around too much. So you've got the invertebrates there. And I mean, my pond is absolutely full of pond snails at the moment. <laughs> yeah. But also, interestingly, I've got a lot of wolf spiders that I quite often see skating across the top of the pond as well. Yeah. So... Yeah, that's another option. I've got ants that come down to the edge of the water. So right on the edges there, you've got those. But then more importantly, you've also got the option to photograph frogs and toads if you have them mm. in your pond. And for me, yeah, if I'm going to photograph po uh, frogs in my pond, it very much has to be at eye level. And I did actually think about this when I was installing my pond. There is a way that I can get my camera more or less at eye level to the water. Um, and by getting eye level, you have some options there. If it's a still day, you can actually get a really nice reflection. Uh, I tend to pick slightly overcast days because if it's a really bright, sunny day, lovely as the weather has been, there's a chance you can blow out your whites and get like really like high contrast areas that you possibly don't want in your photo. So I tend to pick a slightly overcast day. And you know, I'll sit there on the, you know, right on the edge of the pond, camera there, and you can get these beautiful reflections, just the frogs going about doing their 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 froggy things. In terms of toads, generally speaking, I don't actually get the toads in my garden until the evening, and they don't come down to the pond until, you know, well in well into the night. But it's an opportunity if you've never tried night photography of frogs and toads, it's a real opportunity to give it a go. And um, one thing I would say is 
I wouldn't use flash. It's much better to use a static light, like a little LED. Um, that's what I use for all of mine, um, a little LED light. They seem to be happier with that. It doesn't seem to disrupt them as much. A little bit of light on them, and you can get some really lovely kind of nighttime effects. So it could be a really good time to actually try out some night photography as well. But, yeah, that's kind of some general pond photography. I've actually had pond, I've photographed pond snails as they've been out of the pond as well, climbing up on oh, yeah. bits of grass and stuff there's um, a couple of species that are almost amphibious really it's called the wandering ponds now and i've never found out why but i've often suspected it's because they tend to wander out of the water and back into it again quite often mm. so, yeah, yeah i mean i've i've had them up grass stems and that and i've actually had quite a bit of fun trying to photograph them on there and it, it's both fun and frustrating and it is definitely worth uh, sitting there you know for a while and pursuing it um, but these things are quite small so macro lenses i think are definitely going to be needed yeah. for that i think it's it's the bladder snail isn't it that is the proper that's actually more terrestrial than aquatic but we'll go into mm. pond that's the one you've got parasitized the fly larva i think isn't it I think yeah bladder snail. Yeah, yeah that's the one that's a damn pony one yes well obviously it's me so i'm now going to talk about the using an aquarium to photograph pond creatures i'll very quickly mention uh you can uh, i'm giving away all my trade secrets now if you've got some pond skaters and stuff and you find your pond's too big to get a decent picture of them you can quickly scoop some out and put them in a tray and i find you know just put some you make the water dirty and not not clear you still get reflection but it covers up the fact it's in a tray maybe a bit of moss on the outside something like that and you could put them in there and i find if you just put the water level a bit lower than the edge of the tray it does tend to stop they will still jump out so do it near the pond so if they jump out they go back in the pond yeah and you can get some pictures that way and you know once they settle you can get some, obviously they're quite wide flat creatures so the depth of field can be quite interesting but you can get some interesting shots if you you wait around and try different angles but general pond creatures as in ones that are under the water i'm risking repeating myself here uh, from the previous episode but i'll just quickly run through the basics you can use an existing aquarium i generally find glass is better because they tend to be more square you don't want anything that's curved and the plastic tends to scratch quite easily the perspex and stuff uh, you can build your own make sure you use aquarium safe sealant to do it though um to get get the glass stuck together the i say rule i always mostly live by it my friend dave is religious about it jack perks not so fast, but then he's doing fish, which are bigger, so it's less of a problem. When you use flash, it is a problem, is clean water. Make sure whatever you put in and the water is clean. Now, do not use tap water because it has chlorine in unless it's been treated. If your pond, you know, if you've got really hard water, you might have to be a bit careful because your pond water might, if it's all rainwater, might be a bit too soft and, you know, don't want to mix up different chemistry. So I tend to use water from my water butt and... Yeah, it's generally clean enough to photograph in, I find. So basically, the very quick way to start is get your aquarium. You don't want a huge, great big one. You want a smaller one, obviously. Get some pond weed that's been thoroughly washed. Uh, give it, you know, give it a shake in your pond or whatever and some pond water. Um, get a tray or a bucket and wash it in. That obviously clean as well. Wash off as much dust as you can. Place that in your aquarium. Try and place it so the creature can't just go straight into the corner you can't always avoid that and i tend to tell people to start with things like a damselfly nymph or a mayfly nymph or a dragonfly nymph things that creatures that like to sit still and perch on that bit of plant and then you can sort of play around they will slowly crawl away and stuff like that and some will just not cooperate for you things like water lice tend to just crawl off and disappear flatworms and snails will seem like a good choice because they're so slow but they'll constantly move and have a habit of going up the glass but then of course you get an underside view it's not the end of the world water boatmen can be okay great water boatmen are quite good because they'll go to the surface so if you leave them long enough they'll come up to the surface to get air and you can get them then i'd advise steer them clear of things like diving beetles or stuff that just will just keep moving although they might fly the surface if you're lucky as well but yeah start with one of those lighting a led light can be quite good especially on a square tank just i just put them above the the get enough bit of glass or something and just rest it above the tank can be quite good or off camera flash you don't want to use the on camera flash because you'll just get a white light reflecting off the front glass and you're going to have to play around with the lighting to, to get the right angle to avoid reflections and glare and all that kind of stuff like i say once you've got your animal set in there you might you want to use a paintbrush just to nudge it slightly and you know obviously be extremely careful you don't want to hurt the poor things yeah and that's just a, a very quick rough guide to pong creature photography i mean i run a whole day course for it to now uh, to cover all the details oh i just plugged it but i didn't actually mean to do that i mentioned it before didn't i i didn't mm. mean to plug that i'm gonna move swiftly on because it sounds like i'm plugging it now 
I believe you have another suggestion as well. Yeah, so this is, I hadn't really thought about this until a couple of days ago. And actually, Neil and I had been discussing about doing a special uh, podcast episode for little photography projects. And when I was out for a walk the other day, I didn't use my camera for this. I just used the camera that was on my phone. So, you know, you don't even have to have like any fancy camera or any equipment or anything. If you've got your phone with you or even a little compact camera, this is absolutely perfect. And actually, it's probably better. So we went out for a nice walk lovely day and I just started to notice all the different plants flowers and ferns in particular that were actually growing in the walls of um, so walls of houses just some walls that are lining roads stuff like that and I just thought actually this could be quite a fun little mini project to do just photographing the different plant species you can find growing out of a wall so I managed to do I think it was five or six on our walk earlier in the week one of which was a fern the other the others were all flowers but there's so much variety and they're much smaller but what you get is you get this beautiful flower or or fern against the the brickwork or the stonework that it's growing out of so you get that lovely kind of contrast between the two and you know if you if you're out on your walk on your your daily exercise it's probably a nice little project to actually do and especially i think if you've got children you can make it into a bit of a kind of a fun fun game to see how many different types Mm. of of wall plant you can get and like I said you don't need any you know fancy equipment or anything I just simply all I had on me was my was my phone and I just used the camera on my phone and that's that's enough so that I think actually is is a lovely little project and I've actually continued it and when I've been out for my runs although I've not stopped to take the pictures I've kind of in my head made a mental note of where they are so when I go for a walk I can actually take them you know next time I go past those walls and it's it's actually made me stop and look at all these different flowers and plants that are growing in the walls now it's made me much more aware of them on routes that I've walked you know probably hundreds of times before from my house but now I'm actually noticing what's in them so it's another you know great little mini project I think that it is is one that would be good for the whole family as well imagine that you get a few more than the dry county I live in I remember when I used to walk around Cornwall and Devon and places like that noticing there's a lot more sort of stuff growing on the walls and stuff and is it na- a navel work is that one that round those nice round leaves and the, obviously it's a bit early in the year and a huge great flower spike coming out of them I remember noticing them as a kid so yeah sounds like a good project no? yeah there's, there's and it's mm. really interesting and it's, it's making you really take note of what's around as well mm. I might have a look on my walk tomorrow. I don't ever go past many walls, but we'll find out. You do get some strange looks when you're stood there yeah. photographing plants. I get strange looks anyway. <laughs> yeah, <I'm true. laughs> yeah. Yes. So mine, I've got a, I've got a couple more to suggest. Uh, one which are kind of linked, I suppose. The one I was going to mention is Macro Studio. So obviously, ideal world, you do your stuff outside, but sometimes the weather's bad or uh, it's too yeah, you know, so it's too windy or wet, and there's not much to be found. Or you've got a very uncooperative subject. Now it's not like I've done much of, but this is in fact how they film a lot of the stuff on nature documentaries on insects. So you're basically setting up a little mini habitat, usually inside in your shed or something like that, and you film the creatures in there. So obviously you know there's an ethical thing of you got to look after your creatures, same as the pond creatures, I suppose, that I mentioned earlier. And you've got to be a bit honest about this. You can't claim it's in the wild and stuff. So now I've covered that a bit, got out of the way. So one way I've done this is I've taken a tray, using one of my old pond trays, and you don't put it flat on the table. You put it sort of long edge towards you and put, you know, something that's about an inch high behind, on, on the other end, so you a slight angle. Then fill it up with soil and leaves and moss and stuff to make it look nice. It'll depend on what habitat you want to do. And one option you can do as well is put a little... Uh, dig out a little bit at the front so you can fill it with water at the front and the idea is that you've got a tray now that has three sides that are raised to stop things running off on those three sides and the front edge is level with the soil and stuff you've got inside so you can get to ground level inverted commas it's not really ground but you know what i mean with your creatures and uh, you put the water in there to hopefully stop the creature running out the front. But obviously, if you've got wolf spiders or something like that, they'll probably just run across the top. So you just got to watch that. It, it's sometimes an idea to put this on like a big table. So if something runs off it, you can quickly scoop it into a pot. So have a pot of a brush ready and stuff. So you set yourself up. You might want to set your lighting up ready. 
and then go out and find your creatures. Now, I sometimes used to do this at work occasionally when a child caught something really good on a mini beast hunt and I put the pot somewhere safe out of the sun and when the kids have gone home I've quickly photographed it before I put it back which is quite nice and yeah it's quite good fun to do so things like ground beetles quite good uh, wolf spiders you can uh, jumping spiders you'd say if you find like a jumping spider in your house or something you can, it's another good play wood lice all sorts of those sort of things uh, centipedes I've, I've had a go at as well and yeah it's just something to do inside when the weather's a bit rubbish and something a bit different but it's also quite good if you want to work on some video now, now a lot of people shoot stills but a lot of people have sort of dabbled in video but not really and there is a lot of cross skills you know skills that from stu- from stills to video but also at the same time somehow it's completely different as i found i've been i, I suppose i can't just claim to be dabbling now i have actually done a few bits and got a youtube channel like everyone's got i suppose but i just thought i'd give you a few tips on video just getting started so basically every slr or mirrorless camera certainly mirrorless cameras have got video mode if you've got a panasonic you've probably got as good as video you can get without getting a dedicated camera really uh, bridge cameras have got it too and this sort of works for a lot of them i a few tips i always say well i, I always say i picked up i just say i didn't come up with these ideas is use a tripod you gotta keep your image steady you can get away with a slightly wobbliness on a still but on video it's critical rather than try and follow the creatures around and keep it in focus because your focus on video mode tends to be a bit rubbish unless you've got a dedicated video camera and even then not as good is try and sort of focus on a spot and have the the subject come into the frame so it's quite good if you send the bird photography focus on that perch and have it quite small so the creature has to fly in you can get the bird flying in and flying out and looking around maybe or singing hopefully if you find a bird singing and quick set it up it's always a race against time if you can get hold of a shotgun microphone uh, that gives you more focused sound as well uh, but quite often you can add the sound later like just have some music or something a few tips that i've read uh, and have helped me is avoid zooming in i shoot with prime lenses so i don't have to worry about that but this whole zooming in the home video zooming in and out thing it rarely works unless you you know you're on a gyroscopically stabilized helicopter camera and zooming in on a giraffe and then zooming right out to show it in its landscape or something like that otherwise it's generally sort of advised against it's worth trying them you can always delete it one bit that i found has worked now speaking to some professional cameramen half of them say this is very important and it is if you're doing sort of cinematic films but not quite as important with wildlife but i try to do it you shoot in manual mode now video it does get a bit confusing and i used to get confused you've got shutter speed and you've got frame rate now your frame rate is how many frames a second you get so it shoots off usually it's about 30 frames a second or 60 frames a second depending on what camera you've got but you also have a shutter speed which is how long each one of those frames is exposed for so it can be 30 for a second or 100 for a second or thousand for a second and they recommend to get a nice sort of flowing video uh, that looks nice but not not too flickery you should double your frame rate so if you've got a 30 frames per second frame rate you need to shoot at 60th of a second shutter speed which you know it can get a bit confusing with some of these things some cameras will shoot up to shoot at 60 frames per second so you need 120th of a second and some will go up to like 120 frames per second and stuff like that uh, my panasonic gh5 i think it does 180 frames per second so i can slow down six times so that's quite good i come to slow motion in a bit now that can get quite tricky because that means you've got a set shutter speed you have to shoot at so you have to juggle your ISO and aperture a bit as well yeah it's something to play with and if you've got if you can't i mean people get like nd filters to try and darken the image if it's too bright and stuff like that but i've never faffed around with that in the end sometimes when some action happens you just record of what you got and work with it later if you try and record something in one spot uh, i tend to press record and then not touch my camera you don't want any wobble if you can help it one other nice little tip probably found upon by some is if you've got 4k video you only really need even if you only need hd recording 4k but zoom out slightly give you a better depth of field and you can crop the image and if you do get a bit of shake it gives you a little bit more room for any shake and if you, the wider you've got around the subject the more you can crop down to compensate for the shaking of the camera obviously a lot of cameras are limited to doing 30 frames a second or six frames a second but you might want to do some slow motion well that smartphone you have in your pocket almost all of them now have some sort of slow motion video on it it's usually hd as well probably won't be as good quality as like a professional slow motion camera obviously 
But I've got some really nice footage of the red mason bees uh, going in and out of their holes because they'll focus quite close. Again, if you've got one of these clip-on macro lenses as well, you could get some rather nice stuff. But when you're doing video, you tend to be a bit more zoomed out to show the action taking place. But yeah, have a play with your phone. It's quite good. I mean, you can get these. You can, like rest it on a beanbag on your tripod, or you can get these phone holders you can attach to a tripod as well. You might have one kicking around if you ever bought a selfie stick. I do own one, but that's just to stick my waterproof cameras under the water. I'll let you off then. Yeah, yeah. I've, I don't think I've ever used it for a selfie. In fact, I have two and I don't think I've ever used it for a selfie. When it comes to editing, uh, if you've got Apple, there's, some, I forget what the software is called, but there's a, a one. There's Windows Movie Maker as well, if you've got Windows. I have been playing with DaVinci Resolve, which is a free version of DaVinci's, you know, top of the line professional stuff. It's surprisingly, the amount of functions on it, it's a real, if you've just started on video, I wouldn't recommend it. It's there's a lot to learn there. It's like Photoshop or Lightroom, even on the free version. If you're thinking to get into video, it's worth trying to learn it because it's a really powerful bit of software, actually. But yeah, there's plenty of different video things to edit. Have a go at video. It's worth a go. You've got time. You've got time to edit it and play with it as well. You know, if you've got any questions, I would say ask me, but I'm, I will not pretend to be a professional level video editor, although you know, I'm getting there. But, I mean, if you've got any questions on anything we've said today, I'm sure me and and I, hopefully I can speak to Victoria here. She'll be happy to answer your questions. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Just give us a shout. And, and actually, you know, if you have tried anything out, please do let us know either through our Twitter or Facebook page pages because yeah. um, we'd love to see, you know, what little mini photographic project you've been yeah. able to do during the lockdown. Yeah, if you come up with your own, just do let us know. We're happy to share them on our uh, Twitter and Facebook feeds. Yeah, yeah and I'll, I mean, we'll, we'll share some of the stuff that we're doing as well in, you know, in our own gardens. And I'll, I'll share some of my wall flower images oh, yeah. so you can see some of those and yeah, any, any little things that you're doing just let us know and, and neil and i will both share our little projects we've got on the go as well probably more neil than me because there's not still not much photography going on for me yeah, more, most, more most, gardening at the moment yeah i've been playing with my hydra again today so uh, i introduced him to some water fleas and got some nice footage so uh, that should be quite good hope you better share that soon if i get time to edit it I've got to edit this podcast first <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean but, even even if you're just going out for your walk i mean i said uh, you know i mentioned about the wall plants but even just taking your phone and just photographing whatever you see out on your walk it, it would make a nice little record i think as well of you know those walks that you've been doing and you know the time that we're currently in as well yeah there's there's a few other things you can do that we haven't touched on because neither of us are particularly expert on but you can do a bit of astro i've done a bit of astro photography um, if you live in a dark sky area, you're probably better off. But you can still get away with stuff if you use there's a program called Secretor. I'll, I'll, I'll post a link or, or just actually contact me if you need it and I can send you a link, which will process to get rid of a lot of light pollution. But there's there's meteor showers going on and the Starlink satellites destroying our night sky and basically making like, you know lots of artificial light sources up there. I must I'll keep meaning to do it and I've got no excuse now have I been home all this time not really no I think I mentioned the nature TTL sites been posting lots of nice ideas and Olympus have been sharing lots of ideas of things that are not necessarily nature photography related to do as well so yeah, have a look at all those sources as well and there is another one that I'm just going to quickly bring up now that I came across earlier uh, and it is on Twitter it's called more than weeds so it's at more than weeds and is basically looking is embracing the wilderness but in cities uh, and more urban areas and they're you know looking you know, basically encouraging people to go out and see a little bit like the wall plant seeing what what plants you can find in the urban areas so you know that's definitely worth worth a look if you're on twitter yeah have a look at those and this is kind of like kind of everyday nature small plants growing on pavements or out of walls and there's a book i should i could recommend richard peters it was a nice chap, actually. He came and gave a talk at the conference I ran. He, he's the chap that took the picture, you, some of you may have seen, of the shadow of the fox on the brick wall, which is still one of my favourite pictures. And he's done a whole book. There's a lot of it, most of it is pretty much uh, using these cam traptions type camera traps. So, you know, it, it takes a photo when the animal triggers the sensor. And that's a lot of that is done in his garden. And the book is actually called Wildlife Photography at Home. So if you look online, or go on his website, I think you can buy it directly through and get the ebook, which is probably the best thing to do at the moment. And yeah, have a read of that. I've got, I've got a copy of it. It's a good book. I haven't had a chance to put it into practice yet, unfortunately. I've, I, I keep spending the money that I would spend on the contraptions and other things that I needed a bit more, unfortunately, at the time. But that's another option to do. 
but again have a, as i hadn't tried it myself i thought didn't feel qualified to speak on it but richard peters certainly knows what he's on about um having I mean, one european photographer of the year one of those pictures which shows you how good they are so really, another really nice one of him sitting at his computer and the badger on the patio or the decking outside the window walking around which is really nice and there's a few other nice pictures too so uh, it's worth it for the pictures that book to be honest <laughs> it's quite good well i think that might be it from us nice short episode it's only a bonus one yeah it is uh it's actually our 13th episode i believe yeah so um but yeah just just something to give you some little ideas of stuff that you can do while we're in this lockdown you can decide whether it's lucky or unlucky yeah now now you've listened to it (laughs) (laughs) right well okay well stay safe everyone let us know how you get on and uh we'll speak to you next time yeah we'll catch you soon take care bye bye bye